Hey, welcome to STV. Coming up on this week's show, we're back at Timken to belt out some more from Ultimax. The Dragon is in the shop getting some clutch maintenance done, and the SRX is on deck for first burn, where no speed limits were broken. STV is brought to you by Yamaha. Conquer snow with Yamaha. Ultimax Belts. Performance driven, performance proven. Ford F-Series Canada's best selling line of trucks for 53 years. Tough, smart, capable. Last year, I made a pretty bold statement. The Yamaha Sidewinder is the most powerful production snowmobile ever. Or, in the words of Yamaha, This might have been a little premature because for 2019, the Yamaha dropped the hammer. The last version of the SRX lived in the days when triple, triple two strokes dominated the industry and the fastest guy across the lake, well, he's the one that had bragging rights. Since those days, there's been a definite shift to powder performance, which has sacrificed top speed. Yamaha felt this lake racer type customer needed a sled that was better suited to them. And they had the power, they had the name, all they had to do was make a few tweaks and they could get it done. The first change Yamaha made was to the ride height by lowering it. This lowered stance helps the sled cut through the air at speed because it has less of a hole to punch through. And it also lowered the track drivers, helping to cut down on the angle of attack, improving rolling resistance. Interestingly though, Yamaha didn't limit the travel. The SRX has the same as other sleds in their lineup, they essentially just lowered the ride in. The other major change, and in my opinion, the real secret to the SRX is the track. It's a 137 inch rip saw with only one inch lugs. This took a bunch of weight out of the track, making it easier to spin faster, and the smaller lugs catch a lot less air, which becomes a real thing when trying to go fast with big lug tracks. It's also a 2.86 pitch, and it's fully clipped to, again, improved rolling resistance. Pretty much everything else on the SRX is the same as other sidewinders on the snow, and these tweaks simply improve the efficiency of the SRX, making it faster. But it's not all about straight line speed. Corners are just as much fun, and I think the SRX is the best handling Yamaha I've been on in a while. The low ride height has a bunch to do with this. With a lower center of gravity, the weight of the SRX doesn't want to pull the sled over as much in the turns, but I think it's the track that's made the biggest improvement. I rode those old triples a lot back in the day, and let me tell you, you could steer that machine as much with the rear end under braking and acceleration as you could with the front end and the skis, and that was because those old tracks were about a half inch high and they would really let you slip. These new machines with these big meaty lugs they just don't let you work the back of the machine as much as in the corners. With the relatively small lug track of the SRX, you can get the rear to step out controllably under trail braking into a corner and then use the power and track slip to your advantage off the center and to help you get pointed off. The SRX even felt like it reacted better to body English than other lighter sleds I rode under the same conditions. 
I have to say the trails that we were on were perfect for the SRX. We were first tracks on flat squeaky trails and the corners were a mix of long sweepers and not so tight 90s. Conditions were good for the SRX and it was fast, but it was its balance of grip front and rear that blew me away. And even as conditions deteriorated and the trails got tighter, the SRX still performed better than I expected. But there's a but. The modifications made to the SRX in the pursuit of speed do come with an obvious price. The lower ride height means you have less travel under you for rough terrain. It's easier to push through this remaining travel on a gravity hit or sucker bump or if you catch some unexpected air. The SRX definitely bottoms out a little quicker and a little harsher than regular sidewinders. The one inch lugs on the track also sacrifice traction in deep snow. Get off the trail into even moderately deep powder and you need to be thinking ahead about where you're going, where you're gonna stop, and how you're going to get going again. But there's a but to that but. I don't think SRX buyers care about these sacrifices because the benefits of these changes outweigh them for them. And I don't think these guys care about carving up powder and I think they will forgive suspensions for the odd hit because that's the way they rode back in the days of the last SRX. What the SRX buyer is gonna care about is that when he comes to a big flat lake, Yamaha Blue is gonna be out at the front of the snow dust cloud as he leaves everybody else in it. Except for maybe this guy, the Articat Thundercat. Coming up after the break, Articat's Thundercat throws down with the SRX. It's no secret that the brother from another mother to the SRX is the Articat Thundercat. Now the DNA of both these machines are practically identical and if there's any differences between the two at all, well that comes from the philosophy of their families. Like the SRX, the Thundercat is set up for speed with the lowered ride height and 137 by 1 inch ripsaw. However, each sled is refined by the engineering and testing teams at each individual company and honed to their specifications. All major components remain the same. Engine, chassis and turbo are all identical, so neither sled can be called out as a ringer. That leaves refinement changes to things like clutching, gear ratios and suspension setup. Another place these sleds differ is in the ski department. Yamaha continues to install their Tuner 3 up front, while the Articat has their Procross 6 ski. And honestly, this is one area the cat comes out ahead of the Yamaha. Back to back, I like the Articat ski better. On hard packed trail, the kind that squeaks when you walk on it, both skis perform really well. But when things started to loosen up, the cat ski had a bit more bite to it which makes it the more versatile of the two skis. Each sled is equipped with the Fox Zero IQS shock package that is three position adjustable right from the handlebars. I liked this system when it was manually adjustable on each shock and although having to stop and turn the clickers yourself by hand was a total first world problem, the electronic control is a nice touch on high end rides like these. The IQS is easy to use as a rider and the three positions are different enough from one another that you can really feel the change. This simplicity really is the answer for every rider that's looking to adjust their sleds to changing conditions without having to totally geek out on suspension setups. Riding the Thundercat is almost exactly like riding the SRX. In fact, if you were to close your eyes, you wouldn't be able to tell which sled you were on. But I wouldn't close your eyes for long if you're on the gas with one of these sleds. The biggest difference in feel is in the skis. Everything else is so equal, it's tough to choose which factory has dialed in their version better. Each sled is tremendously fast, balanced, and should be classified as a double black diamond expert level snowmobile. If you're a rider who's looking for the ultimate four-stroke turbo lake and trail missile, either one of these sleds will get the job done. I 
I did manage to find one little thing that crept up on each sled, and that was brake fade. Being as well balanced as both these sleds are, and with the Hayes braking systems being as good as they are on each machine, I was able to modulate the brakes really well coming into the corner and trail braking in deep without locking the track up. This put a bunch of heat in the rotor and caliper, and each sled suffered from a bit of brake fade in a relatively short amount of time. This problem is not unique to these sleds though, and it's an easy fix by changing out the brake fluid to higher temperature rated stuff. Now, I suppose you can always back off a bit, but there's no fun in that. Without having any timing and scoring equipment on hand, and the only device at my disposal being my butt, and as scientific as my seat of the pants feel is, it was not accurate enough to choose which sled is faster in a straight line, or which machine can negotiate a corner better than the other. I'm sure the internet forums on each side of the Yamacat fence will be yelling at each other, saying their version is the fastest, or which is the best all road snowmobile. But is that so different from the days of the past SRXs and TCATs? I don't think so. Now, the only place to settle this disagreement is the one place these sleds were built for, the lake. Having the opportunity to ride both these sleds on the snow back to back, well, that's just another one of those best day at work type of scenarios. But having to choose which one is better is something that's absolutely impossible to say. Although, this blue one and the way it looks on the snow, it's pretty sweet. The Ultimax line of belts along with this building have had a long history, with Timken being part of the most recent chapter. Timken's primarily um, play in the industrial market and they needed uh, to grow their mechanical power transmission offering with a belt line and in that product offering was a belt line called Ultimax which is ATV snowmobile belt. In Canada that's, that has a big presence especially with the snow that we get um, in our country. Um, the goal was to grow the industrial uh, belt offering and have these other two product groups kind of rolled up into it so really exciting especially in Canada. I mean <coughs> Ultimax it's been around since the early 60s, uh, have a strong brand following from you know, the sled heads and the ATVers out there. And as the side-by-side -side market grows in Canada, well, in North America, period, um, it's such a, such a fun product group. You know, the industrial world is uh, it's consistent, it's, it's got a different feel out there, but the power sports world is fun, exciting, um, and, and the people that play in that arena are just fantastic people, and it's exciting to have that product group and to be able to go after that market. Within that space called Power Sports, there's also a lot of bearings, a lot of seals, a lot of things that Timken has the ability to make and grow into this space. Um, and I think that the Ultimax belt line will help Timken grow into this space as well um, with bringing the, the bearing to market, bringing some seals to market, um, even, you know, even some chain, there's Power Sports chain. I think there's a huge opportunity to grow Timken's core business within the, the power sports arena, for sure. The transition has been excellent. They, they came in and they said immediately that we don't know how to make belts, so this is your business to continue to run. We want to expand our offerings to the mechanical power transmission across the globe, and belts is an important part of that. So you're important to our portfolio as, a, as the Timken company, but we're not going to tell you how to run your business. And they pretty much stuck to that, uh, that policy all along the way. Uh, they're a very big company, uh, so they have some resources that maybe we couldn't afford as a smaller company when we were just belts. Uh, we have large laboratories based in Canton, Ohio that we've utilized to help do some advanced research on our products that, uh, I mean, we have excellent testing capabilities here in Springfield, but they were enhanced by some of those uh, capabilities that we have out of our corporate office. Well, I would say uh, that Power Sports itself is a uh, fairly small segment of our overall business, but it is a strategic 
part of our business. Uh, we've been in this industry for a long time. We break up our, our business into four market segments, agricultural, power sports, outdoor power equipment, and industrial distribution. The power sports offerings really are connected with a lot of the offerings we have in the agricultural market. Uh, variable speed belts are important in that industry. They're also important in industrial distribution. What we learn in developing products there is leveraged also in the power sports market. So we think we can offer a product that outperforms and is better quality and uh, does everything that the users need out there in the field. It's a key, key offering and uh, an important product, not just to the belts business, but to Temkin overall as well. If you walk around our facility, you see some of the uh, units that we test on, and it's kind of exciting to show that off to other people, and it's good to be part of uh, uh, something that's recreational and not just industrial in nature. Uh, but it also, uh, you know, I talked about how it's complemented by our belt products in other categories, but it's also complemented by Temkin's products in other categories couplings and housed units and things that uh, also go into this same segment uh, throughout uh, the globe actually. So. What really makes us the, the strongest option is, is a couple of things. Um, one is the history that we have in there, uh, the, the fact that we've done it longer, we have made more belts than anybody else on the planet. Um, we've made uh, we our relationships with the all the OEs um, should show something about the quality of the product that we put out. Uh, we are we invest more than any other aftermarket company when it comes to creating the R and D behind the belts. Uh, we get a lot of uh, testing on vehicle specific stuff. When it comes to when it comes to power sports belts and especially snowmobile belts, every application is different, and so we devote a lot of time into making the right belt for each sled, rather than just saying we're going to make a belt and we're not really sure if it's going to work on everything. Here, here's the belt. We hope for the best. Uh, we do the work on the back end to make sure it's going to work on each individual sled. Every every year. Um, we go, we test on that year's model sleds to make sure that, that we're meeting our, our metrics. So another little project we've got for the old Dragon here is a clutch service, not to be confused with a clutch rebuild, because if this thing needs any parts, I don't have anything here to fix it with, but I think it's fine. This is more of a maintenance thing. Starting with the secondary, we're gonna pull this right off the sled to have a look at it on the bench. Now you can get some special tools to help do a service on a clutch, but some muscle and a pair of snap ring pliers can usually get the job done. If you need to replace parts, things get a little bit more serious and you may have to bring in a professional. Now what we're looking for here once you're inside the secondary is for any excessive wear on these ramps of the helix or the roller bushings on the spider. Rollers are notorious for seizing and then flat spotting. Some non-roller secondaries have slide bushings that you need to inspect for wear too. Brake cleaner is your friend when it comes to washing out any old rubber dust and oily residues. This buildup can really hurt performance and speed up wear if it's not cleaned out. From here, I'm going to take an abrasive pad and just clean and scuff up the sheaves. So we're about to start on the primary. Now, good rule of thumb before you even touch this thing is make sure your keys are off and your kill switch is down because you're gonna be moving this thing over and you really don't want the motor lighting off while your fingers are in here. Before I remove the primary cover, I'm using a punch to make a couple of dots to line up things for assembly. Some clutches may be balanced as a unit and it's good practice to put things back from where they came from anyways. For the primary, we're gonna leave it on the engine, mainly because I don't have the proper puller to get it off, but this is just a service, so I'm unconcerned. Now, because of the Dragon's design, I've run out of room to completely remove the hat, but I still have enough room to do what I need to do. 
you can use a pry bar to compress the spring and get the pressure off the rollers and then a socket or something like that to wedge it open. This may not be the most correct way to do it, but it does work. Just watch your fingers if the wedge slips out. It can hurt a lot. Open like this, you can inspect each roller for flat spots and to make sure they rotate freely. Next, check the flyweights. Each have pivot bushings and pins that wear out, so that's what you're looking for. There will always be a little bit of play, and that's okay, but if anything is seized up or bounces around, these parts will have to be replaced. These, though, seem acceptable. Last on the primary list is the tower buttons. Make sure they're all there and that there's still plenty of meat on them. Clearance on ours is about five thousandths of an inch between the buttons and the posts. Again, brake clean is a great way to wash out any old residues and rubber dust that have gathered up. With everything clean, I'm putting the clutch together dry without any lubricant. Now you can put some light oil on the rotating pins, it's really up to you, but I like to keep things dry as I feel lube can make dust just want to stick a little bit more. As expected, the clutches on the Dragon were in pretty good shape. Now, a few of the rollers and a couple of the bushings showed some signs of wear, but other than being a little bit dirty, things in there were fine. I was really looking for anything broken, which there wasn't, so this thing is good to go for the snow. Now, a full clutch rebuild, that'll have to be on another machine for another episode. Hey, thanks for watching. Until next week, I hope all your trails are flat, your lakes are frozen, and your powder's deep. STV has been brought to you by CKX, wear your passion. On Snow Magazine, for snowmobilers, from snowmobilers. Is the SRX, where no speed limits were broken. Not really, I broke a little bit.